Thank you. All right, well, I wanna welcome everyone to Coffee Coaching. Um, and we are with Ellen Kovitz this month, sorry, um, from Elevations Unlimited, and he's gonna be doing our presentation. I also wanna thank our sponsors. So if you're ever there, let them know that you heard about them at Coffee. We have Barbarian Bakery. In here. Um, they got some great baked goods. And Trey Sorrell do sing the pup pot and ice cream. So mention to them that you've seen them on coffee coaching so they know that we're mentioning them. Alan, you want to go ahead? Sure. Thanks, Cindy. I know a lot of you, a lot of you know who I am, but uh, bear with me today. I am really under the weather. In fact, I'm going to the doctor right after this. So if I get into a coughing fit, just bear with me. We'll we'll get through this best way we know how. Um, so the whole idea for this presentation came from a book that I wrote uh, probably 10 years ago. It's this one right here. Go figure, Elevated Leadership. So it literally has to do with the strategic planning work I've done over the years. And if you talk to you know, Judy and Dina at the chamber, you know, they'll say that that's part of the reasons why we're a five-star chamber, because we stuck to, we created a strategic plan, you know, 20 years ago, stuck to it, redid it multiple times, and uh, you can see the results. So that's something pretty important. Um, anyway, this is going to be wide open. So if you have a question, just shout it out, put that crazy Zoom hand up, and if uh, Cindy or, or I see it, um, she can stop me or I'll, I'll think to stop. But uh, this should be an open discussion more than me spewing or else I'll be coughing the whole time. So, so give me a hand guys, I appreciate it. Um, let's see what else, any other ground rules aren't? Oh yeah, as far as the book Elevated Leadership, it is not for sale. I only use it with clients. So it only can be gotten from me, okay? So that's that. I do have another book we'll talk about in a little while, but I'm not here to sell books today. I'm here to give you some information, okay? So sit back, relax. If you're driving, sit back and relax. And uh, here we go. So I have a first slide here that I'm actually not gonna talk about until the end. There we go. So the vision of Elevations Unlimited. Elevations Unlimited drives a new economic spirit by developing entrepreneurial leaders. So we're gonna talk about vision and why a vision is important and how that vision for me drives what me and my associates will do every day. We wanna drive an economic spirit and that we realize that that's done in this country through entrepreneurship. And that's our sole fur purpose is working with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial driven organizations to drive a new economic spirit. So let's talk about elevated leadership and what's inside there. What's the theory in there? So you guys might've heard of John Maxwell. The single biggest way to impact an organization is to focus on leadership development. Simple, simple, is it? But think to you guys, the people that are listening here today, does your organization have a structured leadership development program? If not, it's the single biggest way to impact an organization. I've seen it, I've worked on it, I've done it, and I've been doing it for close to 40 years. So it works. Leadership is all about results. Peter Drucker said that. So think about that for a second. It's not about certain things. It's not about being smart. It's not about being happy. It might not even be about being nice. It's about getting results. Leadership is the most important single factor in determining business success. Brian Tracy said that. So you have John Maxwell, Peter Drucker, Brian Tracy, having all these thoughts and ideas about leadership. What is leadership and why it's important? Does anyone have any questions about that? Before we move on? By the way, you're allowed to disagree. What else? 
So the whole idea of elevated lead, leadership is to move from a competency-based leadership model to a results-based model. So what does that mean? Competency-based, and you guys might have been involved with this. I've been involved with it before I started my own company. That's when a company says, we want all our leaders to be a certain way. We want all our leaders to be visionaries. We want all our leaders to be humorous. We want all our leaders to have these seven characteristics or competencies. So we're gonna teach those competencies. What I say is bollocks to that. It's more based on a results-based model. That's what leadership is, about getting the results that the organization needs to get. Not about how it's people, uh, what specific competencies they might have. They might have these competencies and might not use them. It, it's about creating a vision for the organization. Think about it for a second. And if you could be honest and raise your little yellow hands to show us if you work for an organization that does not have a vision, or if it has a vision, you cannot recite it. So I only see like six of you. And all six of you are saying your companies have a vision and you could recite it right now. I say bollocks to that too. <laughs> so don't- Are you all you know, sleeping out there or what? <laughs> they are, they're still waking up. They're still drinking that first cup of coffee. Me, I mean, I'm just trying to stop from coughing. But uh, every organization that's worth its salt has a vision. And we're gonna talk about vision and what a vision is. It's probably the most critical piece. That vision should be aligned throughout the organization. So it's not just the CEO and the vice presidents that know what this vision is. Someone at the ground floor should know. So here's a story. Some of you that know me might've heard me speak at LCD or at other places with the chamber, but I'll tell you this story. You know, Cape Canaveral, 1964, it's uh, 11 o'clock at night and four senators are, are walking through the building and it's very quiet. And at the end of a hallway is this woman over a bucket mopping the floor. And the one Senator says to the woman, oh my goodness woman, it's you know 11 o'clock at night. What are you doing here? And her answer was the perfect one. I'm helping to put a man on the moon. That's what aligning vision throughout an organization looks, sounds and feels like. No questions yet? Geez, Cindy, we're gonna be done by a quarter after. I do. This is Jasmine. I have a question slash statement just to pick your brain out. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So I worked in the banking industry and management. I can barely hear you, by the way. Hold on. Let me see. Um, hold on. Oh, hold on. All right. Um, hold on. Can you hear me now? A little better, yes. Okay, so it's because I'm in a car, I'm sorry, but I'll try to yell. Let me know if it's not like I'm screaming. Um, but just a quick question slash statement. I, I, I used to work in the banking industry for years as in management, and um, just looking at your compensation base um, com compared to result base, I noticed that um, they started trying to gear towards the more results base, you know, so the management. Before, when I first started in banking 19 years ago, we would get a lot of trainings about personalities and how to handle this and how to interact with the associates. And then they kind of went away with that and more so the results-based training. Yet we, um, I noticed some of my peers, the other managers, um, started not being able to understand how to relate with their associates to motivate them because they lack certain characteristics. Um, where I had those certain characteristics and I was able to excel in other areas compared to the peers. So do you think when you're so focused on results-based, Sometimes it um, hinders the ability for the manager to be able to um, motivate their employees if they don't know how to, um, if they're trying to work with someone who's struggling and they don't know how to build before or to, um, of course, connect or different characteristics that is important with that. It's a result. 
that's an absolutely great question and great observation. And I agree with you. A lot of times we do that with the values of the organization. So in other words, you know, the values. So everyone in the organization has to have the value of empathy. I'm just making this up, by the way. Right, right. right. So that if everyone had a certain value, uh, you can relate that to a competency, but it, it's actually deeper than a competency. So it's everyone having a certain value and, you know, which is, uh, it's non-negotiable. You either have that value or you don't, or you're gone. Right, because you can't teach empathy or, you know, um, active listening. It's something that you got to either have in you. Um, but I just noticed that when um, they started hiring a lot more managers that didn't have certain traits or skill sets, it, came, it became very um, much so cumbersome for them to um, manage their team when their team started struggling. Because they were always like, well, you got to get this number, you got to get the number. But they wasn't digging into, well, how can you help your team member get the number? So they were just focusing on the results. You know? So remember, leadership development is the number one way of enhancing the value of an organization. Exactly. So if people are just put in there and told to get results, it's not enough. So this is a right. whole process. This is an entire process that we're going to see as we roll through it. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and part of that is providing results-based goal-setting model for employees to utilize. They have to understand how to set a goal and how, how to utilize certain tools to get the results that they need to get personally and to help the layers above them get results and layers below them get results. I have a question that kind of dovetails um, from Jasmine's. Sure. Which is um, right now, the main um, course of study for uh, like, people in my industry and a lot of government level um, companies are, is equity and how to bring um, inclusion and belonging in every aspect of your business. And how, how does your elevated leadership fit into that? Well, Helen, first of all, good to see you, my dear. Um, it's good to see you too. <laughs> se second of all, um, I think, again, this is part of values. And we haven't gotten the values yet. It's the values of the organization. If diversity and inclusion are part of the values of an organization, that has to be stated and, and, and espoused. So it's, it's separate than goal setting, okay? If it is the only goal, then we're missing a whole layer around that, which we'll get to. OK, in other words, there's more to this than just these five bullet points, but great question. And yes, a lot of companies are getting into that. All right. So we already know this. The whole idea for the leader is to get results. And of course, those results in the future are what we call the vision. How do we want it to look? What is it going to be? So let's talk about the vision a little bit. So it's a mental snapshot of the future. What does it look like? It's a possible future. And it should be the most, not the easiest, it should be the hardest and the furthest away. A good vision can last forever. It might not be something that needs to change, but it certainly should look way out into the future. What can this organization become? What could we be? What will your organization become? How will it look? What will it accomplish? What sort of people will work there? How will it change the world? It has to be vivid. You have to see, hear, taste, feel, and smell it. Your employees should know it off the top of their heads. It should be pretty small. Some of the best visions I've ever seen are less than five words long. And just by hearing the words, you can tell. It's worth expending energy on. People get excited for it. They want to be there. They want to be part of it. It's important. Sparks new ideas up and down the organization. 
hey, I've got something that we might be able to utilize for us to get there or get part of the way there. But this is the number one thing, the vision. It provides a common focus. It would, again, it'd be like leaving Delaware and knowing you want to go west. Well, that's kind of a snapshot of the future. It's possible. Is that it? Where do, how do you start? Where do you go? It has to tell the story in as few words as possible. Because if you make it three sentences long, your people will never be able to remember it. So it has to include everything in a few short words. And believe me, gang, I've been doing this long enough to know that that is possible. Cindy, do you remember what the chamber's vision is? No, it's too long. <laughs> I mean, I agree with you. If it's like, you know, more than five, six words, I don't remember it. I have to look at it to read it. It's only one sentence. So it's not that long. No, oh, okay. But I don't remember I mean, it either. I don't even <laughs> It's been three a long years time. ago. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, it has right. been. And I haven't looked at it in a long time. I'm going to look it up, though. So before we move on, any questions about vision, its value, what it is? Again, you know, th this is from a book. So there's a lot that goes into this. Doesn't the vision make you feel like, like it's kind of your dream of what you want to accomplish, too? Yes. Isn't it? Cindy exactly is what it is. Yeah. Right. Because I noticed when I um, was in business, I'd get this big vision of what I want to do, you know, and then I try to get my team to see the same vision. Yeah, exactly. After no comments, questions, let's move on to other pieces. Well, values. And this is where most people get stuck. So let's talk about values and what values are because this actually led me to writing a book that came out last year. So values are the beliefs, standards, acceptable behaviors that your employees are allowed to show, should show, it's the truths that guide action. It ensures consistent application of ethics. It simplifies decision-making, determines the rightness of direction. After working with, I don't know, 500 boards, probably even more in, in my day, what I found was that the boards had a hard time creating the value structure for an organization because the individuals themselves didn't have their own values sorted. They didn't know what their values were. So that's why I did this. And this is what I did during COVID. So came out last year, a book of values, which is real short and sweet, but it gives people an idea because it's a list of 52 values. So at least they can see what, what this value is, what it does, and people can say, yes, that's something that's important to me or no, that really isn't important to me. So I've been working with boards using that and man, it makes a huge difference because then individuals themselves can understand what their values are and then apply perhaps their values to the organization or how they might be different. And by the way, once values are determined for an organization, they're non-negotiable. So if, for instance, if one of the values of an organization is happiness and there's someone who's a sourpuss working there, they shouldn't be working there. It's that simple. Any questions about values? Cindy, do you know any of the values in the chamber? You really hit me early this morning. I, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you don't, it's you're okay. You're me on the spot. I don't. Okay. Not right off the top of my head. No problem. 
That's terrible. <laughs> Get me. No questions? Is this stuff too deep for all y'all out there? First thing. Mary, in the did you raise your hand? They're all still drinking coffee. <laughs> like me. So is Mary Lois. I, I didn't really have a question, but um, I was just gonna make a, a comment. I know that in in my business, compassion I would consider, consider to be a, a value that's very necessary because I deal with um, uh, disabled folks and to yes. have compassion is yes. very important value. <laughs> that's brilliant. So imagine if you hired someone who didn't espouse or show compassion, they yeah. couldn't work for you. In my type of business, compassion is big. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the welfare of your uh, customer or slash patient. Mm -hmm. You know, you value them more than you do yourself, pretty much, you know, what their needs are. So you you're starting, I can feel with the two of you talking how important compassion is. We're learning, you know, because we, we, we've been in transportation and transportation has gone through a lot of phases. And for a long, long time, it was very car centric, a very auto centric. And now we're learning to be more empathetic and think about people who do not have um a vehicle or do not have regular reliable transportation who depend on transit who depend on walking or biking and we are we are actually building um roads and infrastructure to support that now which is a, a big difference than 25 years ago you know so as an industry our values have evolved yeah yeah and that would make sense you know because you almost have to i always look at things like i put my feet in someone else's shoes just to see you know mentally how they are i mean you know like if i talk to a business and they're struggling i try to come up with some ideas to help them you know brainstorm with them you know to get their mind going important Anything else with values, guys? Very misunderstood. So, you know, this will be the first time I say this. You see my phone number down there. Don't, you know, please, if, if you have a question, comment, anything at all, just want to shoot the shit, just give me a call. Uh, looks like yeah. Inside question. Aging Scouting raised their hand. Yes. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I was trying to figure out where my mute button was. And definitely uh, can relate to feeling sick um, today. So I know one of my values, so I'm in the agricultural industry um, and integrity is probably one of the big ones with our farmers. Um, you, you've got a, our clients and or our, our employees have to have um, integrity with our farmers. So I don't know you, but I, I'd like, may I pick on you? Yeah, of course. All right. So integrity is not one of the 52 in my book. Oh. And I'm going to share why. Because the word integrity, if you look it up, means living by a code. So the question is, what code is that integrity? And I'll give you the biggest example I can think of. Tony Soprano was a man of integrity. He lived by his values every day. So integrity, the word in and of itself, means different things to different people. So the more we can put it down to something that means the same to everybody. Does that make any sense at all? Like, what does integrity mean? That's the question. I've had this discussion with hundreds of boards of directors. And if you ask 10 people to write down the meaning of integrity, they'd all be different. But if you ask 10 people to write down what's the meaning of truth, they'll all put the same thing. 
So the closer we can get it to something that's pure, it's not an exact science. So I hope that helped. Maybe it didn't. I'm just saying I think integrity is overused. I mean, I'm making the adjustments to my values now to um, add more clarity to it. Yeah, that, that's all. I mean, I'm not saying not to use it, but I think it helps if we can make it more succinct, you know, more real. And, and you know, and it, it just, it's an inexact science too. So I just found that that's an easy word for, for companies to use, but not necessarily a good one. Thanks, Amy, for your comment. All right, let's move on to mission. And man, you talk about another misunderstood piece of a strategic plan. It's how to move one step closer to your vision. That's what a mission is. So a mission isn't what you do. That might be, might be more a purpose statement. So, you know, when you walk into, is anyone on here from Bay Health? Because I'm going to pick on Bay Health. If you walk into the lobby of Bay Health, do you know what their mission is? To help, you know, the people of Kent County feel better. It's something like that. And I look at that and go, really? A hospital? That's the mission? Come on. So if it's a dust statement where you walk into a hamburger place, our mission is to make the tastiest hamburgers for the people. Really, you want to make good tasting hamburgers, okay? So to me, you see a lot of those mission statements on the wall. And maybe it's to make people feel better. I don't know. But that's not a true mission. I'm talking about a mission like a, militar, a militarized mission, which is a goal. It's about doing something specific. So this is a shorter term move. It has a specific time frame. Generally, it's a year maybe two, maybe three. But we know if we do this one step, that'll take us closer to our vision. This is the modern look of a mission, 12 to 18 months, that's all. The chambers used two-year missions in the past. It's gotta be clear, involving, and memorable. Got to be aligned with the values and directed at the vision. Does anyone have any comments about a mission? So a mission really is the big hairy goal for the next year. It's another way of looking at it. So um, when you say mission, are you talking about like a mission statement or? I no, I don't even like the term mission statement. Okay. So because the mission like, statement, again, Helen, is a duh statement. Right. Yeah. Because like we anything. actually have to write our kind of mission out every two years in the form of a transportation improvement plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, is a, which is a big, thick thing. It's not a, it's not a little thing that you can put on a wall. It's, it's a huge plan that we uh, do every two years. But that's but it does everything you're talking about except for being clear and memorable <laughs> yes but, and, and, and it's probably too large you know i worked for anderson windows for many years the largest window manufacturer in the world uh, out of wisconsin and you know and i was involved with doing the strategic plan and that sucker had to be a foot tall and i don't even know after we created it every year if anyone ever opened it up People knew their individual parts, but it wasn't integrated at all. So this is about integrating all the ideas into something that's shorter. It doesn't have to be that long, even for an organization as big as transportation. It can be shorter. All right. And what doesn't it make more sense for it to be shorter to see where you're at in 12, 18 months? Of course. Of course. Like even in transportation, Helen, what would be the number one thing that needed to be accomplished? Um, I'm making this up in 2023. Right. Well, it it depends on how um, 
how broad of a statement you want to make. I mean, I want to make it broad. Right. I mean, you could say, um, you know, that we're striving to create more multimodal um, avenues for travel from point A to point B, regardless of your abilities. um, All right. Or age or um, or income level, you know, right. that's, that's, that's very, that's a very broad statement. But what we do in our tip is we actually bring it down to these are the actual roads that we're going to be fixing in the All next, right. yes, in the next three to four years, not we Del dot. <laughs> these are the roads that Del dot's going to be fixing <laughs> in the next four years. Yeah. Um, these are, you know, and we do that every two years, we actually get down into the nitty gritty. I get it. So it might be, and again, I'm making this up because I sure as hell don't know. I don't work for Dell Dot, never have. But saying, you know, these 20 roads will be create will become multimodal in the next 18 months. Boom. You know, they might be different. They might be a different intermodal. It doesn't matter. These are the 18 projects we're going to undertake in the next two years. Any other questions about mission? We're getting there, guys. I know it's complicated, but if you want to be good at strategic planning, it's complicated. Here's the big one. It's got to be measurable. So you know if you've accomplished your mission or not. Now think of the mission statements on the wall. Are they being, is it being accomplished? I don't know. Imagine the military creating a mission and they wouldn't know if it was accomplished or not. We need to take out Saddam Hussein. <laughs> was that accomplished? Yeah, it was accomplished. It was a mission. All right, moving on. Critical success factors. So all these steps are steps that are taken in creating a strategic plan. The critical success factors are after a mission. They're the handful of things that are critical to achieving the mission. Three to eight items, critical few, trivial many. They're broad elements. So we're moving from broad to narrow to broad, and then we're gonna get narrow again. These are broad elements. It might be marketing. It might be hiring. Who knows? But they're necessary. They're all the things necessary for that mission to be accomplished. And they're the things that are sufficient. We know if we do all of these, this mission is done. And then we create goals from there. And you guys have heard of SMART goals. Well, of course, you guys know me well enough to know if it's not kicked up a notch every now and then, it's not good. So now we use why smart. All goals have to meet this criteria. They have to be written. <clears throat> They've got to be holistic, which means that one goal should support other goals in other areas. They have to be yours. Now think about that. Pardon me, guys. So it's literally talking that everyone has to create their own goals in an organization that funnel up to the next level. So if you're handed goals, there are issues with the organization, period, because you're not allowed to create your own. Then you know the smart, specific, is yes. <laughs> Pardon me. It's got to be measurable. So losing weight is not a goal. We know that. <laughs> Weighing X amount is a goal. It's got to be measurable. Uh-huh. It's got to be attainable. It's got to be within the realm of possibility. You say, you know, I want to be the first person to land on Pluto. Well, that's great. It's not attainable. 
today. And the R is for realistically high. Any goal you set should stretch you a little bit. And it should be time bound, it should have a date. So every goal should meet these eight criteria. Again, I know we're going through this fast. There's a lot of information here. You need to talk about this. You need some more clarity. Feel free to have a conversation anytime. Time bound. You know, you can always um, email me. I'm at alan at elevationsunlimited.us or call. Questions about goals? No, but I do know for Akwa to lose weight, you're easier to lose five pounds than to say I'm going to lose 50. So it's well, kind of you, basically. You can, but in goal setting, goal setting is, is partially a psychological thing. And in goal setting and planning, you can't lose something. Oh, I never thought about it like Think of, that. Right? So again, writing it positively is important. That's why to weigh X amount, you're increasing your odds of making it happen just by saying it that way. Okay. Like, you know, I want to weigh, you know, a buck 40. I will weigh a buck 40 by June 1st. That's a better way of stating it. So that puts you in a productive mode of doing something, of taking some action. What else do we have on here? Ha! All right. Does anyone work for an organization where the goals of the organization kind of look like this? And I know I have. All over the place. Well, they're all over the place. Everyone's goals are irrelevant to someone else's. They don't make sense to a third person. So this is, you know, an organization out of alignment. And I, I will say that it's well over 75% of organizations are out of alignment in some way, shape, or form. And the whole idea of elevated leadership is to get things in order. Will it be perfect? No. Are organizations complicated? Of course. But the more we have our vision and values created, then create a mission, then do all the goal work underneath that, the better things will be, period. Any questions about that? Because I think I have to go back to the front now where I want to go. Questions, ideas, concerns? See anybody raising their hand? Or... Yeah. All right. So let me go back. Bear with me. If I knew how to do it better, I would do it better. <laughs> well, we will get there. I am getting up. All right. So I'm going to leave you with this. This is called the law of process. And the law of process is irrefutable. This is just the way things work. And you, you see four boxes, one, two, three, and four. You see three arrows that go both ways, one arrow that goes one way. On the left-hand side, boxes are ineffective. And on the right-hand side, the boxes are effective. So let's talk about what all this means. So box one is unconscious incompetence. We don't even know. Well, let's take a company. A company doesn't even know that it's not doing well. So think about one, and I love to pick up, is anyone here in the car industry? Good, because I'm gonna pick on the car industry because it's an easy industry to pick on. So unconscious incompetence, we're going to go back to the 70s and take GM, the largest automobile manufacturer in the world. And they were getting their lunch eaten by Toyota, Datsun, with the little cars. So they didn't even know that they weren't doing well. Until, ah, the bridge of discovery. You know how they discovered they weren't doing well? Well, sales are going down. 
profits are going down. Dealers are complaining. What's going on here? So they discover that they're not doing well, which puts them in another box. In that box, now they're consciously incompetent. They know they don't know what to do or they're not doing well. They, damn, we're not doing well. So they have to cross another bridge to get to conscious competence. And that's the bridge of learning. They have to learn what to do so that they can get back to doing things right and doing things competently. So far, is this making sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Because I'm only gonna complicate things going forward. So they steamroller right along. Things are going well, things are going well. They're repeating what they're doing. It's working well. And that puts us in a box of unconscious competence. They don't even know they're doing well. They're doing the same thing every year. Crank out those cars. Boom, 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 boom. But what happens, there's one more bridge to cross and it's a one-way bridge. complacency and man GM crossed that bridge. Anyone have a Pontiac anymore? Anyone have an no. Oldsmobile? You know, anyone have a Saturn? It's complacency. So now they're back to unconscious incompetence. Now this model helps us determine where we are so we can take the appropriate action. That might seem easy, but it really isn't. So we're gonna do it this way. Not only is this law of process something that makes sense for organizations, but it makes sense for people. So think about which box you're in right now. Most people will say they're in box three or in box two. If we were all together in the room and I asked for a show of hands, guarantee 95% of you would be in two or three. Now here's the bottom line on this process. And this is what we can talk about to close the day and have a conversation. You're always in box one. No, we, All are. we don't know what we don't know. Did that stun everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I don't understand why not four. Okay. Four is a place where you're just going along, going along like you always have, and things are working well. What I'm saying is, if we're always in box four, we never get to explore box one. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think the exploration of box one is what leads us to make major discoveries. You know, what's the meaning of repetition? What, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's the issue. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so we can take, instead of complacency, we can take, um, you know, honesty or just openness to get to number one and say, hey, and this is the area, you know, as a coach um, that I use my coach all the time to dive into this number one. You know, where am I blind here? What am I not seeing? What are the questions I'm not asking that I should be asking? What are the steps I might have to take that I don't even know exist? That's what I'm talking about. It's not only work. This is personal stuff too. 
So to me, this has a lot of different mm -hmm. areas of use. Any other comments about this? Do you feel that you can be in multiple boxes at the same time? In different areas of your life. It makes sense. You know, yeah, maybe I'm you're, you know, you're, let's say your marriage, you know, you might be rolling along in box four, you know, just same old, same old every day. Get home, make dinner, watch a TV show, go to sleep, you know, boom, 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 boom. While at work, you know, you, you've discovered something, you might be in box two, and then you're learning something to get you in box three. I'm saying we're always moving along in these different boxes in different areas of our life. What I'm saying is I think most human beings are afraid of box one. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they should be. That's a good part of the pool to dive into, in my humble opinion. Any other thoughts about this? Well, I, I think that's true because I don't know how many people want to say they're incompetent. <laughs> so, but when you look at it the way you, you explained it, you, you're not conscious of the fact that no. you don't know what you don't know. No. So you, maybe you think you know. It. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you know, and the whole thing about being, in, you know, is there anything wrong with being incompetent? What, what I think of is when, um, when someone starts a brand new job and they have not had a chance to be poisoned by their coworkers <laughs> and be um uh be jaded by bad customers be uh you know um all of that stuff and so they're just going along on the edge of the cliff with no idea that they're about to fall and they're just diving into everything and doing everything because they don't know that they're that they're not supposed to be able to do it and a lot of times those people accomplish way more than the than the people who have been in the business forever and ever and ever and say oh we tried that and it didn't work or oh you know this customer is a horrible person so don't go talk to that person or whatever and this person just goes and does whatever they can't do because they know too much well said Helen mm -hmm. um, you know I think if we um, remain in box one it kind of allows us to evolve and grow you know because then we don't get to that point where we get to the I know it all I've been there and done that so it, I think it makes life a little bit more um, interesting to stay in box one because then you're continually growing and evolving I, I couldn't agree more mm -hmm. you know the first time my coach showed me there's a box you know I, I, I'm, I'm never in one and he said, you're always in one, you stupid shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, he was right. Because in certain aspects, we're always in one. In certain aspects, we're always in all of these. But if we approach it with that open-mindedness to look at doors that we didn't even know existed, think how cool that can be. And, and then try to open them. Huh? And then try to open them. Yeah. New doors. Open them. See what happens. Yeah. I mean, what's the worst that happens? You know, these, these are areas of um, learning, perhaps. Um, it's not just knowledge. You know, it could be a vast thing that we have been against looking at or, or, you know, who knows, our own biases might lie there. So it's just a cool place to be. So, you know, so keep this chart with you. Look at it. You know, again, I walk. Think... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just thinking, you know, that you said that one's probably the best place to always be. And sometimes now they explained it, I probably am in number one all the time because I'm always trying something new and trying to open a new door. Yeah. You know, 
Um, but do you think it's fear sometimes that people don't want to, you know, fail? So they don't want to try? Cindy, it's fear all the time. Mm -hmm. okay. All the time. You know, and, you know, fail, you know. If we don't fail, we don't learn. Right. I mean, I've been going through life and never failing. Yeah. <laughs> and everything just works. I like it when you say the people at the top say the only reason you get to the top is because you failed more often. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I agree. But some people are afraid, you know, from whatever it is, their upbringing, whatever it is that they're afraid to fail. So they don't take those steps that other people do. Uh, you know, from my observations of high performing entrepreneurs, on the outside, they appear fearless because they're the ones that are not afraid to make those big steps that other people just will not do. Do they fail sometimes? Sure. But when they hit the ball, they hit it a long way. I mean, it's way out of the park. And it's beautiful to see, you know, instead of the person that won't get up to bat. Well, I don't want to strike out. Go ahead, strike out. You know, what Babe Ruth struck out half the times he went up to bat. That's how it goes. And I think in business, you know, we play that game where we're afraid. So Cindy, you hit it right on the head. Yeah, and how do you know it's going to work unless you try it? You know, you try it. If it don't work, then you move on to the next idea. You know, you just keep going. You do. So it's a mindset. And I think this whole law of process is a mindset. So that's how we do it. Any other questions you ask about anything? Nothing? We have a lot of people. Everybody falls asleep. Yeah. I'm going to jump in there just for a second. Um, don't you believe that in order to have that fearlessness, you also have to be in an environment and this comes from the top down, your leadership has to be in the position to allow you to make those changes. There has to be a nurturing environment to let you say, okay, it's okay if you try this and fail, and I'm not going to look any differently on you and your coworkers aren't going to look any differently. I think a lot of this comes from the environment that you are yourself in. And that kind of trickle downs from there. Agreed. You know, and if this sounds like a commercial, I apologize in advance. But that's part of why I believe it's important, incumbent upon us to figure out our own values. What is important to us? And then find an organization that has similar ideas. And that might be one of them, where the organization's value is fearlessness. I don't know. Could be. You know. But I think a step in the right direction is what the CDCC does for us in these coffee is giving different perspectives yeah. and helping us to obtain maybe a higher level of understanding of the situations that we put ourselves and our coworkers in. And I'm grateful that you take the time to do this as well, but I'm grateful to, for the CDCC to give us the opportunity to sit in and, on these as well, um, to hear a different perspective and hopefully take away something from these coffee chats um, that we can bring to the workplace for our other our other people. Oh, I, I so agree. Thank you so much for saying that. I think um, mm -hmm. I appreciate that, you know, being past chairman of the chamber and being on a board for many, many years. That means a lot. And I, I believe these these conversations need to expand even beyond just, uh, you know, an hour a month, or wherever it is. You know, these are the kind of conversations I like to have on a regular basis. So anyone, anyone wants to have one of these chats over a cup of coffee somewhere, just let me know, because I'll be there. I've, I've got something else to add to the incompetency. I mean, just the sheer volume of um, innovation that we're seeing, you know, everywhere. We got mm. cryptocurrency. <laughs> um, I'd say five years ago, I got in the car. I didn't know how to start it because it was a push button. Right. Uh, right. So, that. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's just so much innovation. And if you're not willing to acknowledge the innovation that's coming about and how it's going to change your world and knowing that it's going to be a constant incompetency um, just with that alone. Wow. 
big. Thank you. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, okay, I have like a weird question. Um, when when you're in when when you're talking to companies or to businesses or to you know people who deal with the public are you noticing a difference in how people are willing to give other people the space to discover and learn and all that stuff in the in in today's environment it it just it seems like we're in a very divided and um hostile environment sometimes um particularly you know when you're um not not just politically but just socially too um that we're we're just in a in a weird place right now and do you see that do you i mean are you is it just me because I spend too much time on the internet? <laughs> or... I, I don't know if it's just you, number one. But you asked me the question, so I'll answer it. So many years ago, I decided that, uh, it was probably 10 years ago, that in my business, I had the right to literally choose who I worked with. So I began to be more selective about the people and the organizations that I worked with. So you can imagine um, or not the road that's taking me down. That's taking me down a path of working with high risk, high reward, very hyper positive human beings that don't get into the morass of us versus them, you know, liberal, conservative, all, all, all that dichotomy that you feel and see. When, when I'm working with someone, I'm not working with people that, well, that's part of their consciousness. They, they have bigger fish to fry than worrying about that. That's, the, that's answering the question from my point of view. So I stay out of that fray and my clients stay out of that fray. And yes, I have some political people that I coach and work with, which is interesting. Did that answer your question? So from my point of view, um, the people well, I work with aren't in that, you right. know, you know, us versus them mentality. I, I just, the, the, those aren't the kind of people I want to work with. Right. So, you know, I, maybe I've earned that over the years, you know, being the right, well, not old, <laughs> the right age that I am, <laughs> but I can do that. You know, in my younger days, I'd work with anybody and bear the brunt, but now I don't have to. And there is a world of human beings and organizations out there that could care less about the political environment. Right. Well, like us as an organization, as far as the individuals that work here, yeah, that's that's probably who we are too. But we deal with a public that just seems very different now than it than it was even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. That may be the case. And if you take your um, screen thing down, we'll be able, you can see everybody and we can have everyone introduce themselves before you end this. I wanted to throw that you in. Like that? Go. Yeah. Look hey, good to see everybody. <laughs> yeah. So every, everyone's afraid of being seen. Uh, I know. Nobody's got their pictures up. That's all right. Oh, I, hi, Brandon. So I will give a copy of both of my books to the first person that can guess 
where I where I am sitting in front of. What Who else? else? <laughs> I was going to say I'm not allowed to guess because I know. No, you don't. Oh, oh, I don't. I don't know either. I can't guess because he told me. And I'll take it. It is not Wales, my second home. It is not. Oh, okay. Oh. Hmm. See, I would have guessed that it was Wales. Although there are places in Wales that look like that. Oh, yeah. That is not Wales. No one has a guess? Is it near Wales? Is it like Ireland or Scotland? Well, that's two guesses, Helen. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, Ireland. (laughs) Is it Greece? Not Ireland. Someone said Maryland. That's my favorite. Maryland. (laughs) Maryland. Not Ireland. It's Um, not Scotland. Is it Italy? Is it? Is it not Greece? Italy. Caribbean. <laughs> not Caribbean. Not is it in the Mediterranean? It is not in the Mediterranean. Okay. Huh. Hmm. California. Not California. <clears throat> Mexico? Not Mexico. How about Malta? Hawaii? Pardon? Hawaii? Malta. Oh. Hawaii. Another good guess. Not Hawaii. Malta? Delaware. <laughs> Malta. Another really good guess, not Malta. Delaware. <laughs> it's not Delaware. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> we don't have any place that high. <laughs> All right. I will, so this is how, what, what the deal is going to be. The first person that calls me and invites me to lunch, I'll, give, you know, I'll bring a copy of both of my books. That's number one. But as far as where this is, this is one of the Channel Islands. No. Oh. That is the Isle of Jersey. Okay. It is in the English Channel. You can yeah. see France <laughs> from there. It's a fascinating little place. So been there. <laughs> so that's where that is. Well. Anything else? Before I go to the doctor and get taken care of. Yeah, maybe we could <laughs> have everyone introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with Erlene up there, since she's on her phone. <laughs> <laughs> we can. Yeah, I just want you to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Erlene George. I'm one of the ambassadors with the chamber. Glad to serve. Um, I'm also a substitute teacher, but my main passion is helping people with their finances, and I run a financial education business. And great presentation Mary. today, Alan. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, yes. Mary Lewis. Mary Lois. Well, good morning, Lois. everyone. <laughs> Mary Lois Barnes. <laughs> That's okay. I get a lot of uh, variations. Uh I am with Alternative Solutions and been with the Chamber for quite a few years. And I've had Alan's, bless you, I've had Alan's training uh, all the way with the Masters. It's fantastic. And so is Alan. Um, My mission is to provide a healthier and better life for everyone. I am a holistic nutritionist. So I'm here to guide anyone who's interested in uh, feeling better. I always say my business is alternative solutions. And when I was in pharmaceuticals, they asked why. And I said, it's the alternative to side effects. So uh, mm-hmm. Mary Lois Barnes with alternative solutions. And thank you, Alan. It's fantastic. You're welcome. Helen? Hi, I'm Helen Wiles. I am in public outreach with the Dover Kent County Metropolitan Planning Organization which is a transportation, um, federally mandated, mostly federally funded nonprofit. That's what we do. And Alan, you know, anytime you're free and I'm free, we can go to lunch. (laughs) Thank you. Brandon? I'm Brandon Gale, Nickel Electrical Companies. Um, we're the largest uh, merit shop electrical contractor in the state of Delaware. Uh, always looking for, you know, leadership coaching and, and you know, uh, re- well, 
really recently a lot of audio books, you know, the John Maxwell's, you know, all those leadership books. So any any type of leadership uh, insight that I can get, uh, I like to uh, try to participate in. So this was a very insightful. I appreciate your time. Welcome. And Joanne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joanne Cartanza, and I'm with First Class Properties. I'm a real estate agent here in <laughs> County. I am licensed in Delaware. I'm excited to be now involving myself with the chamber. Thank you, Cindy. Kathy. You're welcome. Cindy. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Um, yeah, you gave me a lot to think about as far as my own personal vision, Audrey's vision at First Class Properties her mission statement. Um, yeah. And my mission vision as a real estate agent, and also a volunteer at Bay health. <laughs> um, that's where I'm going right now. Um, that's, that's my fun job is, uh, volunteering at the hospital and helping out, you know, getting people where they need to go, taking the baby blankets to the sixth floor. That's my favorite job. Um, but yeah, no, I love being a real estate agent. I like helping people find their, either forever home or downsizing, upsizing. Um, it's, I've been an agent since 2018 and um, it's very exciting. And I'm very passionate about, you know, helping people and doing the best I can to represent them and have their best interest. You know what I mean? Like my goal is to represent them and, you know, um, do whatever I can to help them, you know, win the house that they want to win or sell the house that they need to sell. So um, I'm grateful to be here and thank you, Alan, for all your information this morning. You're welcome. Thank you. Karen? Oh, oh. Hi, I'm Karen Vicks, um, Law Officer Karen Vicks. Uh, I represent disabled folks, both um, social security claimants and veterans. And I got to run because I have an appointment right now. <laughs> Okay. But Thank wonderful presentation. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. And then Insight AJ, I don't see a name. I'm sorry. Yep. No. Um, name's Nicole Cranbeck. Um, so I'm a new business um, compared to everybody else I've heard here established in uh, 21. Um, so I'm an agricultural service provider. Um, our mission is to provide information that increases focus um or i'm oh, sorry that reduces the risks common in agriculture um so we we collect raw infield data um identifying diseases and in insects um and then handing our data off to clients whether that be farmers um agronomists or other uh, chemical companies so that they can base their um, pest programs um, off of our finding, and that's for the in-season um, decisions. Uh, wow. So, yep, um, new, definitely on online with the I don't know what I don't know, and that's why I'm joining a lot of these conversations um, and have gained a lot of um, knowledge with the CDCC um, and their, their networking. So, thank you. Yep. We try. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Michelle DeVillers. Thank you again, Alan. I, I, I really enjoyed that um, presentation. It gave me a whole lot to think about. Um, my company is Celestial Shoes. Um, we're a mobile shoe store. Um, so that just means you don't have to go to the mall. The mall comes to you. So um, once again. Thank you. Tracy? Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Ingram. I'm a money transformation coach. Um, I help ladies primarily identify their um, sacred money archetype, which is a um, glimpse into who you are, what your money thoughts are, what your energy is around money. And once we identify what your archetype is, we can help to um, reframe some of your thoughts about money, identify how your energy aligns with business opportunities so that you're always working in alignment with, with your energy um, and as opposed to against it. And um, you know, discover what lights you up and what drains you and um, 
Alan, I really appreciate this today. That thing about integrity kind of blew my mind because I know I use integrity a lot in, in my own mind, at least. And um, <laughs> I didn't realize like how what a vague word it is and that I probably should dig a little deeper and find words that, that better clarify that for me. So I really appreciate this. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Deborah. Hello, Deborah. Oh. We'll go to Jennifer. Jennifer Jerzak. You there? No, maybe not. Hi. Yeah. I am here. I didn't get my mute off. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay. um, I am on the road, so I couldn't uh, turn the video on. But my name is Jennifer Jerzak, and I'm business service representative for Department of Labor, Division of Employment and Training. And our mission is actually to connect, bridge the gap between uh, businesses and job seekers. But I work on the business side, so I help businesses, okay. uh, find employees, put on events, and with grants. Thank you. Thank you. Try one more time, Deborah. Nope. Well, I want to thank Alan. I also, before we close this down, I'm always looking for ideas or people that would like to do these presentations or what you'd like to see more of. Um, I know I did a big marketing. I'm thinking now maybe leadership is a good one. You have to listen to Brandon. Um, maybe we could stir a few that way. But if you know anybody or you have any suggestions, just give me an email or give me a call and I'd appreciate it. Thank you again, Alan. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Uh, Great seeing you. Bye. <laughs> hey, Michelle. Jennifer and Deborah. We will end these. Thank you.